Right, so good morning everyone, we might get started. So welcome to the Commission's panel discussion on service configuration. I'm Penny Armitage, the Chair of the Royal Commission into Victoria's Mental Health System. I'm joined by my fellow Commissioners, Professor Alan Fells, Dr Alex Cockram and Professor Bernadette McSherry. On behalf of the Commission, I acknowledge Aboriginal peoples as the traditional owners across all the lands on which we are based for today's panel discussion. And I pay my respect to their Elders past, present and emerging. Before we commence, I would like to acknowledge the breadth of the issues that we are covering today and to thank Dr Margaret Grigg, Julie Anderson and Peter Kelly for taking the time to participate in today's panel. I know a considerable amount of effort has, that has gone into the development of your witness statements and in the, into the preparation for today's discussions. We are particularly mindful of the time that you have afforded us in the context of the current pandemic. We appreciate that you are likely managing competing priorities and your generosity and flexibility in this environment will go a long way to supporting the Commission in what is becoming increasingly important work. Today's panel discussion is intended to provide an opportunity to actively engage and interact with issues around the configuration of, mental health systems, of the mental health service system. In particular, to examine issues and opportunities related to catchments, consumer access to services, streaming and components of care in the future system. We have chosen to convene a panel on this particular topic given its foundational importance to the structure and organisation of the mental health service system and the fundamental differences this can make for consumers, carers and their families. One configuration question before the Commission is how the future system might provide consumer-centred, coordinated experiences for people. The need for increased integration and coordination between services was repeatedly expressed throughout the community, Commission's community consultations. For example, as one participant described at our Shepparton consultation, it can't just be about funding. We need to look at the systems as well as the people. How do we integrate that better? How do we cement systems? If connections rely on individual people and their relationships, once you've lost those people, the connections fall away and you have nothing. As described by a mental health consumer in Star Health submission to the Commission, community health means to me that I can access a service in one place for all my health needs. It provides a continuity and familiarity which is of, a, is of pivotal importance, particularly when one has reached senior status. Another critical configuration question for the Commission is which services should be local, regional and statewide. The Commission recognises whilst there is a need to ensure services are locally available and accessible for consumers across all of Victoria, it is not always possible to do this and provide sufficient specialisation and expertise for consumers with, le with less common and more complex needs. The Commission appreciates the difficulties associated with travel and the need to reduce this for consumers, their families and carers wherever possible. As described by Bendigo Health in its submission to the Commission, for patients and their families, carers, living in rural and remote areas of Victoria, access to Melbourne-based services incurs significant family dislocation, costs associated with travel, accommodation and lost income, and removes the sufferer from the social and service supports within their local community. At the same time, the Commission recognises that access that to access some mental health services, travel was, will be necessary and beneficial for people to receive more specialist care. Del delineating between these services, uh, what's, which services are required locally and which services will be more effectively delivered in, in, on a regional or statewide level, enabling access to the latest research, a critical mass of expertise, is one of the many challenges that the Commission and Victoria Government face. The third configuration question pertains to the role of catchments in the future system, both from a consumer and carer perspective and from the perspective of governance and commissioning. The Commission has heard from individuals who would like catchments in their current form to be removed to allow more consumer choice. For example, as described in John Richard Newton's witness statement, people should have the right to choose whether they access mental health care where they access mental health care, just as consumers of other health services, for example, orthopaedic or cancer services are allowed to choose. 
Others have argued for alignment of catchment boundaries for the purpose of improved navigation and service planning. And others focus on the important role catchments currently play in requiring health services to provide care to consumers who may otherwise miss out. These issues are complex. And today's panel is just one way that the Commission is conducting its inquiries on these matters. In addition to today's discussion, the Commission has undertaken, undertaken significant consultation and, and engagement with consumers, families and carers, and will continue to do so in the coming months. Finally, on behalf of my fellow Commissioners, I want to extend, again extend my gratitude to Dr Margaret Grigg, Julie Anderson and Peter Kelly. Your statement can, statements canvas a range of views, insights and ideas for the future, and we look to, forward to hearing from you further. I will now ask Senior Council Assistant Stephen Amara QC to provide some opening remarks before we formally begin the panel. Stephen. I'd like to commence by thanking the Chair for her introductory remarks and the Royal Commissioners and the Commission staff for identifying the important topic, the subject of today's discussion. As you've already heard, today's topic is entitled Service Configuration. This topic directly embraces issues at the heart of the deliberations of the Commissioners during this phase of the Commission, leading as it does to the preparation and publication of the Commission's final report in early 2021. The topic is very much at the heart of the Commission's work, principally because the configuration of the mental health system in Victoria is fundamental to its efficacy and accessibility for all Victorians through the coming decade and beyond. This Commission is very much focused upon the configuration of a system that's both robust and recovery focused in order that all Victorians may be able to access and enjoy the benefits. The Chair's already outlined some of the critical issues of significant interest to the Commissioners and indeed to the Commission, and I should probably identify in broad terms some of the further issues to be considered and discussed by today's panel. The first is the role and distribution of different types of treatment, care and support in any forward-looking system, supporting the mental health of all Victorians. The second is the role of hospitals. The third is the need for services between bed-based or hospital services and the provision of primary care. The fourth is the role of hubs or as otherwise described community-based mental health services. The fifth are the components of care in the different parts or areas of a mental health system. The sixth is the extent to which mental health services may be streamed and in what particular service context. And the seventh is the role of catchments and associated issues such as governance and funding. At this point, I should introduce and commence by thanking our pa panel members in advance for their time, enthusiasm and generosity in this process. Without the contribution of the many witnesses, including today's panel members, the Commission could not progress. In no particular order then, I should commence by uh, referring to the first of our panel members, who is Julie Anderson. Ms Anderson is a Senior Consumer Advisor in the Office of the Chief Mental Health Nurse and Office of the Chief Psychiatrist in Victoria. She has a lived experience of recovery and lived experience in working and in clinical and mental health community support services. She had long experience at very senior levels of NEMA National and in 2015, sat on the expert reference group for the Commonwealth Government's response to the National Mental Health Commission's review of mental health services. Our second panel member is Peter Kelly. Mr Kelly qualified as a registered nurse in 1992 and has been the Director of Operations for Northwestern Mental Health since 2005. Northwestern Mental Health is Victoria's largest publicly funded mental health service it provides services to approximately 1.4 million Victorians in the northern and western suburbs of Melbourne. Its services are organised into six local, mental, uh, local area mental health services and programs spanning 32 sites. Northwestern Mental Health also provides a number of subspecialties. Our third panel member is Dr Margaret Grigg. Dr Grigg is the Chief Executive Officer of Forensic Care, also known as the Victorian Institute of Forensic Mental Health. 
She has a PhD in psychiatry. Dr. Grigg has worked as the Executive Director of Health Service Policy and Commissioning in the Department of Health and Human Services and as Director of Mental Health in that department. She's also worked in the non-government sector, having served as the De Deputy Chief Executive of Mind Australia. On behalf of the Commission, may I extend a warm welcome to each of our panel members this morning. I should mention that each member of today's well-qualified panel has prepared a detailed witness statement in response to questions posed by the staff of the Royal Commission. In due course, those statements will be made available via the Commission's website. Each member of our panel will now confirm that they'll be giving evidence today just as if we'd been assembled at a hearing face to face. And I might just ask Ms Anderson if you can confirm that first. Yes, that's correct. Then Mr Kelly. Yes. And Dr Grigg, you can do thumbs up if you like. Very good. Thank you everyone. Um, might I commence by thanking you all for your lengthy witness statements, which have covered a range of important issues in this, as has been described both by the Chair and I, a critically important issue in the deliberations of the Commission. Um, uh, in those witness statements, it's apparent that there are some areas of broad agreement between you. And um, uh, I might commence by um, outlining some of those areas of agreement and get each of you to speak in turn concerning some of those areas in order that the, the broad areas of agreement are apparent both to the commissioners and those who come to watch this um, uh, hearing panel evolve. The first is that in the design and configuration of any system for the support of people living with mental illness, it's important to focus upon facilitating recovery as that's the ultimate objective. And Dr. Grigg, I might ask if you can just both confirm that and speak to it briefly, if you could. Certainly. Um, could I just also begin by acknowledging the traditional owners on the land in which we meet pay my respect to elders, past, present and emerging. I'd also like to um, acknowledge and pay my respect to everybody with this experience and reflect that that's the purpose and point by which we're having today's conversation. And just the third thing I'd like to do is a mild correction uh, because then you promoted me to a PhD in psychiatry. My PhD is in, is in philosophy. It was done for a department of psychiatry just so nobody has any misunderstanding about my credentials. Um, look, I do think that the issue of recovery is very central um, to thinking about the future of the system. When I talk about recovery, I'm not really talking about clinical recovery. I'm not talking about um, how effective our treatments might be in removing people's symptoms, although for many people that's an important part. Really, when I think about recovery, I think about personal recovery. I think about people living as much as possible the lives of their own choosing. Um, people are uh, living uh, living in ways that find meaning for them, whether or not they have they have symptoms of what we might call a mental illness, um, which I think is really important and very uh, very important both in the context of really thinking about this is about the lives of of people and uh, people themselves should be determining what those lives look like. Um, and so the important considerations of a broader psychosocial health and human service system are as important to achieving those recovery elements um, as considerations of how we might organise our more kind of limited tertiary health system. Thank you. Um, the second um, area of broad agreement uh, concerns the self-management of mental illness and the, its support with a range of supports, not merely as Dr. Grigg, you've identified medicalised care or clinical care, but also psychosocial supports um, and perhaps the support of psychosocial coaches. Ms Anderson, you've got a lived experience as recover of recovery as we've heard, but also have some views about um, the supports that can be provided to people living with mental illness, but I might be able to get you to speak to that area of broad agreement between the witnesses. Thanks, Stephen. 
Um, I think recovery is supports um, connectedness, meaning, empowerment and um, hope. And for that, I think there needs to be a connected system, not just around clinical recovery, but around the psychosocial supports of recovery. That supported my recovery journey, taking the, um, the clinical perspective together with the psychosocial supports around budgeting, um, house cleaning, shopping, um, looking after children, um, they were ve they were just as important as my clinical recovery. Thank you. The third um, area of broad agreement is that the present system between the hospital um, acute system on the one hand or bed-based system on the one hand and the primary care system on the other hand has a degree of fragmentation in the service delivery and that too often people come out of a hospital admission and fall back on the care of a GP if at all. Mr. Kelly might be, I'd be able to ask you to speak to that particular problem about which there's general agreement. We spoke about this in the conclave uh, last week. Um, I think there is uh, a gap between uh, hospital-based and community-based care and that in the, in, the, in the wider community, in the primary care setting. Um, the mental health system, frankly, is, is overwhelmed with demand and is forced into a sort of throughput system, if I can put it that way. Uh, we are providing care for about the top 0.9 or 1% of people with a serious mental illness rather than the 2 to 3% that's widely accepted as, as appropriate in a, in a health system such as Victoria's. So, um, you know, people come into hospital pretty acutely unwell and leave pretty acutely unwell and uh, we're relying largely on the community mental health system and the primary care system to provide care and support for those, for those people. And at times, um, that, that system is, is under severe duress. Thank you. Um, the, the, uh, the next and fourth area where there's uh, been broad agreement between today's witnesses concerns the value in streaming of care um, and indeed uh, the ways and some quite innovative ways in which that might be um, uh, approached in and by the creation of cohorts or pods in a hospital setting. Um, Dr. Grigg, you've expressed some views um, concerning that. I wonder if you might be able to uh, address that issue for us. Oh, look, I think streaming of, how, streaming of care is an important design principle. Um, there's already a degree of streaming by age. There is um, uh, streaming by some diagnostic groups, particularly when they've got very specific models of care, such as eating disorders. Um, I think that as a panel discussion, um, certainly what I took away from that discussion about really wanting to commit uh, to referencing with my other panel members' views is all of us thought that more could be done with streaming. Um, I certainly, I am certainly a very strong advocate for stronger gender-based um, streaming and, and certainly it's one of our objectives in thinking about the future of Thomas Emberley Hospital that uh, what we don't have is a, a model of care and stream that effectively speaks um, to the needs of women. Um, but I think the other area of streaming that um, we had a long conversation about that was really important was thinking about those people with complex needs, substance abuse, uh, maybe higher levels of occupational uh, risks of occupational violence and how they're screened with perhaps more vulnerable people. And so some of the worst stories of vulnerable, sometimes older consumers being physically assaulted in inpatient units, adult inpatient units, where the mix of patients is so broad that it really is impossible to meet everybody's needs and create a safe environment. Um, well, I think that we balance that off with a bit of a discussion about also watching for issues of stigma in the ways in which we stream. And also my concerns that a system design is able to speak to the needs of people in rural and regional Victoria as much as it's able to speak to the needs of people more densely populated areas of Melbourne. Thank you. Can I raise just before I move to another element of the streaming 
issue, um, a, a particular issue with you, and it's not so much a streaming issue as the access to specialist support issue. You have some experience with the partnership project and the importance of uh, general practitioners having access to um, specialist support in order to provide better care. Within that's an issue about the extent to which, because streaming might be part of this, um, the extent to which specialisation can give rise to better care and, for that matter, general practice can be supported by specialisation. Might I just ask you to speak to that briefly before we move to the final issue of streaming and specialisation? Uh, certainly, and the partnership project was a, a jointly federal and state funded project that sought to strengthen the relationship and linkages between um, state funded services by the uh, uh, by the Victorian government, um, private facilities in our partnership as with health scope, particularly Melbourne Clinic, and thirdly, general practitioner, general practitioners. And what we were looking at was looking at particularly innovative funding options that were able to provide greater support to general practice. Um, so GPs were able to ring and get early advice around consultation. Uh, it helped us support general practitioners to make referrals into um, uh, cohort of private psychiatrists. But we also worked with the private hospital to think much more about which patients we were looking for we were caring for in a private hospital environment. Um, our data showed us actually our patients had a higher rate of private health insurance than we thought, although this is the 90s where generally more people had private health insurance anyway. Um, but, but we were able to work quite closely in a kind of a connected model of care with a, with a private hospital. And in, in many ways, it goes to opportunities around innovation in a local area about how you can create connections between uh, parts of the service system that have traditionally don't operate together because they operate through quite separate funding streams, levers, policy environments. Thank you. Just before we move away from the topic of streaming, um, Ms Anderson, you've identified a, a difficulty that can arise in uh, a streaming approach. Um, I wonder if you can just speak to that. Yeah, um, Margaret touched on it briefly around stigma. I think the um, the streaming through um, illness can be stigmatising for people with mental illness. Some illnesses hold more stigma than others, such as borderline personality disorder. So I think it's a, a it is an opportunity to develop specialist areas. But I think streaming through aged mother, baby, um, and adult is is um, a better way to go rather than streaming through illness because of that stigma question. Thank you. Just before we move away from streaming, I might ask Mr. Kelly um, uh, an issue which arises, and it might not necessarily be an issue of broad agreement, but it, it, is it the position that... Um, streaming can, gives rise to better quality of care or can give rise to better quality of care? And if so, in what contexts? Well, it can give rise to better quality of care and better access to care. And I'll give you a, a, a recent example. There's a niche service at the Royal Melbourne Hospital called the Deep Brain Stimulation Service and the Younger Onset Dementia Service. B the Younger Onset Dementia Service was funded uh, through a grant, a one-year grant through Safer Care Victoria. It provided um, a, access to a, a, an assessment uh, service right across Victoria. So, you know, as, as you know, Wangaratta and Mildura and so on, uh, consumers were able to access that service. And really they got a fantastic service and it dealt with all of the issues you raised in your introduction about um, um, uh, accessing services in the city, um, costing money, uh, costing time, uh, being inconvenient, uh, creating a logistical burden and being unfriendly for carers and consumers. Um, both these services have been recurrently funded by the state government uh, as recently as uh, three weeks ago. And, and that is a tremendous uh, opportunity for people in rural and regional Victoria to access highly, highly specialised services in the area of deep brain stimulation and uh, younger onset dementia. Um, uh, what we've found uh, through that Safer Care Victoria project is that telehealth uh, options for consumers in, in rural and regional Victoria are highly palatable uh, for all the reasons I just, I just mentioned. 
Um, so you're getting access to highly specialised clinicians and a highly specialised service, but the reach is broad right across uh, Victoria. Thank you. Just before I move away from you, Mr. Kelly, the final issue which, about which there was broad agreement concerned um, uh, the, the nature of the space, if you like, between acute or bed-based care and primary care, which I referred to in my opening, and that whilst you don't need to necessarily dismantle the whole of the furniture that might exist in that space, from, among other things, it might create confusion, but the problem is that the system's been degraded. Now, accepting that the system's been degraded, uh, can I ask you to speak to how that might... It's one thing to create recreate a system from 30 years ago, but... How does one create a system in 2020 and looking forward to 2020, 2030? Um, what does that kind of system look like briefly in order that I can then introduce, might be able to then introduce the issues about which we'll be really um, moving to consider? I think, frankly, it's uh, a, a rebuild is going to have to happen in two phases. And the initial phase is actually just trying to build some urgent capacity into the system. And we're starting to see that now with the um, interim recommendations of the Royal Commission. So that uh, in terms of new beds, so the project of 135 new beds is, is starting to uh, gain traction. And, and that bed capacity will be enormously uh, important to us in the short to medium term. And on the back of that, you've got to build community capacity in some of these links between the tertiary system and the primary system. To just illustrate that point, I can tell you that this morning at nine o'clock, we've got 31 consumers sitting in three emergency departments that we service. So at Northern, Sunshine and RMH. And if I just talk about Northern Hospital at the moment, we've got consumers sitting there at 36 hours, 20 hours, 20 hours and 18 hours waiting for a bed. So it's an outrageous situation. We've got more than a full ward of consumers sitting there in a holding pattern in emergency departments, which are high stimulus uh, environments and frankly unsafe for people who are acutely mentally unwell. And how common an experience is that? Uh, it's an everyday occurrence and has been for the past decade. And this goes to um, the issue that you've identified, which is um, uh, both the need for um, immediate support to the system together with uh, proper coordination between the elements of the system, which we'll come to. Is that correct? That's correct. Thank you. Um, can I move at this point to the issues that have been discussed between you as panel members and starting with an issue and one that you identified in your discussions, an issue of some, um, if you like, an issue that might inspire optimism, and that is that the recent um, response, community response, governmental response, medical response to the COVID-19 pandemic and that, that has showed that rapid change is possible. And um, Mr Kelly, I might um, just before I move away from you ask you to speak to that because that's an issue that you identified when we met last week. If you could speak to that to start with. Well, it's both uh, a cause for optimism and a cause for disappointment, I guess, in a way. I mean, what we have seen uh, with COVID-19 is where there is a will, there is a way. So hundreds and hundreds of consumers that have been effectively homeless or sleeping rough have been accommodated in hotels um, uh, over, over the past three and a half months. Uh, that's an issue that seems to have eluded uh, people um, uh, for the past uh, sort of decade, and it's been a growing problem. I uh, also note that 200 intensive care beds were built in the lead up to COVID-19, appropriately, in my view, based on the sort of demand we were seeing in other parts of the world for intensive care beds. However, none of those beds have been used. Uh, the, the accepted wisdom is it costs $1.1 million to build an intensive care bed, yet for the past decade, we've been advocating for more acute beds, and essentially, those appeals have fallen on deaf ears. Thank you. Um, can I move, having introduced it in that way about, and you've identified the need for funding, the need to approach the design of a new system. Um, Ms Anderson, can I ask you to speak to um, the issues of co-design, which you identi you've, also, you've identified in the discussion between the panel members, and the role of consumer choice. If you could commence by introducing those issues, and then I'll ask the other panel members also. I think with the um, national mental health standards that the services partner with consumers very well. It's a standard that they're accredited with, but I don't think we know how to co-design or co-produce effectively. And I think that's a capacity that needs to be built into services around that co-design. There's some very good UK tools 
around how to embed code design into service um, delivery. Um, and consumer choice, I think the choice around um, what services you receive and when is very important. I think you should be able to have the choice to have um, treatment and care in the home, not just in the hospital system. And I think that um, the choice around that treatment and care is, is really vital to a recovery journey. I don't agree on um, seclusion and restraint and, and services that provide seclusion and restraint. Just before we move to um, uh, an issue related to that, I might just ask our panel members to agree, to either indicate that they agree with what Ms Anderson said or maybe contribute something to that topic themselves if they wish. Which part? Um, the issue of either co-design or consumer choice. I fully support consumer choice and I fully support consumer design and I would agree with uh, Julie that it's it's an iterative process I guess around um, you know mental health clinician around, uh, literacy around um, co-design I think I could I could give a couple of examples where we've done that uh, recently and done it very well one around the youth park that's being will be built at uh, Poplar Road in Parkville and the other women's park that will be built at Sunshine Hospital thank you and Dr Greig um, look, I, I do. I think Julie, Julie rightly points out you know, some of the technical and skill issues around co-design. But I do also think that it's a cultural issue. I think that it's really, really important cultural issue in what's a professionally dominated sector, how we really engage. And, and there will be some people who talk about this as the issue of being prepared to share power with people being able to share control. And I do think that it's important and incumbent on services such as ours to be able to tackle the hard bits of it as it reflects in the culture, um, as well as develop up the technical skills and tools and workforce in order, um, in order to be able to um, uh, really effectively kind of partner and as, uh, design services for the people that are intending to use them. Thank you. Ms Anderson, I might ref return to you because you raised the issues of uh, uh, restraint and the like. You've expressed views in your statement concerning the limited, if any, role of hospitals. I might ask you to address that issue as we move to consider the role of hospitals in a system. I think the role of hospitals at the moment is around the episodic nature of illness. I don't think it, it really supports an ongoing recovery journey. I think in some instances, the hospital has a role of containment other than um, a place of care and healing. I think with all the good intentions of workers, I think that in a um, impossible situation as well, that there's the episodic nature, they don't see people in a recovery journey. Um, I think uh, it's really a, a home-like environment or a being at home is more conducive to recovery. Thank you. Going back to you, Dr. Grigg, can I ask you to um, uh, uh, speak to the role of hospitals in a, in a, in a future system, if you could? Um, I suppose fundamentally uh, it depends on what we mean by the concept of hospital and whether a hospital encompasses any bed-based congregate care setting, which is the position I'm going to kind of take on that a little bit. And I think that there's, um, I would cluster it into probably three main clusters. The first is there, there is and will continue to be a need for for tertiary hospital-based care, whether that's about assessment, whether that's about um, ability to access diagnostics that you're not able to deliver in the home, whether that's about really close monitoring. Um, the, the second part of that is I think that there is a need for hospital-like care that gives some sense of respite and sanctuary to people for a period of time. I think our parks hold the aspiration of being the most like that. 
Um, certainly there are people that I talk to for whom just having a period where a period of out on their life for a period of time is incredibly important part of their healing, but that really needs to, um, that really needs to occur um, in an environment that is very, very recovery orientated. But the third part of whether we call it hospital care or not is the issue of extended care, of people who for whatever reason are going to need to sit in some form of bed-based service for often quite extended periods of time, whether that is because um, uh, they really are unable to manage on their own, whether that's actually about um, the uh, management of, of problematic behaviours, high levels of need of personal care, is a few reasons for it. But in its, in its broad sense, if I think about hospital care as congregate-based, bed-based care, I think that, um, I think that there, there is an ongoing need. I think what the system currently doesn't do is two things. Provide people with the option and choice so they're receiving their care in the right place at the right time. And secondly, provide that care in a way and a manner for the length of time that best matches that person's needs. Thank you. Mr Kelly, you've spoken about the uh, crisis and containment role of hospitals um, in the present time. Um, how might that be reimagined and the role of hospitals uh, seen accordingly? Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Uh, uh, if I do a meander down memory lane to when I was an undergraduate student in the late 1980s, the average length of stay was closer to six weeks in an acute hospital bed. And in fact, on the weekends on a 25 bed ward, we'd be lucky to have six or seven consumers actually in the ward. Everyone else was home on weekend leave or overnight, overnight leave. Uh, these days, the length of stay is closer to nine days. Uh, we don't have any leave whatsoever. We're a 503 bed service and I can assure you that with, with the exception of a couple of vacancies in our aged acute beds at the moment, every single bed is full. Uh, so, you know, and what we're trying to do today is find capacity for those 31 consumers sitting in the three EDs. So there's, there's certainly a thing about capacity, but there's also the way the services function, the way they look, the way they feel, how therapeutic they are, and picking up on, on Julie's points, you know, how, how they provide a recovery-based um, uh, service to people in what is a relatively narrow cross-section of their lives for a nine-day admission. I don't, I don't share the view that uh, hospitals are just about containment. I think uh, an acute admission serves many more functions than simply containing someone. It can be about containment, but it's often about family respite. It's often about providing a, an opportunity for a longitudinal assessment over, over days rather than minutes. Um, uh, it's about commencement uh, of treatment, and it's about providing treatment in a setting that can't be provided in a, in a, in a less restrictive setting, such as ECT, for instance, for some people. Thank you. Can I ask you, because you have experience of this in Northwestern Mental Health, to moving to talk about the space between the hospital setting, if you like, and the primary care setting, which I referred to in my opening, uh, one way to access that space is via triage. And you have an e experience in your own organisation of telephone-based triage. I wonder if you can speak to um, the benefits of that system and explain how that system works. As a point of access? Yes. Uh, Northwest Mental Health uh, aggregated its various triage components probably about uh, 10 or 11 years ago now for efficiency and for consistency reasons. It coincided with the state government uh, introducing uh, standardised triage scales. Um, so we uh, aggregated our triage services into a centralised triage model. It's based at Royal Park uh, and it deals with about 100,000 incoming and outgoing calls per year. So it is the first point of contact both for consumers, uh, for primary care physicians and for consultant psychiatrists or indeed carers. Uh, we have set up a couple of VIP numbers so that people can uh, GPs, for instance, are not placed in a queue or, or waiting for call. They can receive um, access more immediately. Um, and uh, we utilise the, the statewide triage guidelines to determine service response for whoever makes contact with that service. And uh, from that service, how is it then determined to where the consumer might be placed? 
At the moment, it's based on, on geography, your residential address. Thank you. Um, moving to the uh, alternatives to hospitals in that space between um, hospital care or that, that form of bed-based care and um, primary care, um, there's been, and there is reference in the statements to notions of hospitals without walls or hospital in the home. Ms Anderson, can I ask you to speak to that kind of model and how you would see that kind of model having benefits? Yeah, I um, I alluded to hospital without walls because hospital in the home for people with mental health issues, often hospital relates to trauma and bringing that trauma into the home is, um, is uh, not not conducive to recovery. So I think um, people can, that teams come into the home and support people even in their um, acute phase of illness. And I think that there can be home-like environments such as park for people to have some of that sanctuary away from, from their daily lives. But rather than um, disrupt a person's life with a hospital stay, I think it's more more conducive to recovery to support a person through what they're going through in their own environment, to come back to that environment and to support their recovery. What do you see as the elements, the supportive elements in um, that kind of model? It's, is, it, is it beyond medical care? And if so, what kind of other uh, forms of care is it? Is it the kinds that you spoke earlier that you have personal experience of, or is it beyond that entirely? I think it's um, it can be medical care. It can be people need to know that their physical and mental health is stable. Um, I think it's around some of the psychosocial supports around um, one, well, the most basic need is having a house mm -hmm. and around budgeting and um Things that are difficult while, while you're at home, even opening the mail can be a difficult thing. So uh, um, a psycho uh, community, a mental health community support person is part of the team as, uh, as well as um, clinical clinicians in the team. And is this something, Ms Anderson, that you see as having value in the bed-based services as well as other settings? In, in the home-like environment, such as Park, I, I don't think any person, if they go to hospital for a physical illness, it disrupts their lives. Um, with add the mental illness on top of that, it's, it's just, um, it's hard to recover from. You're recovering from the hospital stay as well as a personal recovery journey. It just adds another burden onto a person's recovery. Doc, thank you. Dr. Greg, um, uh, we've rather moved into the architecture of what might be um, uh, a system between the two disparate ends of it that I've described, but you've expressed some views about the guiding principles that might be um, embraced before one even begins to um, uh, see how those um, uh, bits of furniture might be oriented between. I wonder if I can ask you to speak to those principles. Um, uh, I, I hope that you're that you're referring to actually ins ensuring the kind of cluster of the sort of four things I thought we needed to um, ensure were available. So, so there is access. There is access that people need to healthcare. There are healthcare interventions that should be um, that should be delivered. Uh, whether that be medical treatment, you know assessment, tests, medication, but actually also increasingly the large evidence we have around the effectiveness of psychological treatments. Um, there are a whole range of psychosocial needs that people have. I think you really referenced it when she talked about a very basic one was housing. I might just talk about stable and safe housing, um, as well as not just necessarily any roof over your head, um, but you know, your ability to have food on the table, your ability to do your washing, open your mail, as Julie referred to, all set of psychosocial needs that need to be met. I think the, the third one I referred to was really related to those issues around 
occupational function. We all need meaning and purpose, depending on the nature and phase of our illness, how much of that we can tolerate may vary for some people. It may be simply finding some purpose to get out of bed in the morning. For other people, it might be really active job seeking. Um, that becomes really important. So purpose, meaning occupation, is a critical component of any system design. And the fourth one I talked about was relational. We need people in our lives. We need to be in environments where we mix and talk with others. Um, and as we, I think as we think about the, the kind of uh, care place and the care journey, thinking about thinking about what components all of these four elements bring and what their various mixes are. So there might be phases of your illness where, you know, 70% of it's sitting in the medical domain. But equally, there may be phases of your illness where actually most of the question is, how do I find purpose for my life? Or how do I build and grow meaningful relationships? Um, and it, all, as that hooks and connects back to my opening statement that recovery for people needs and must be more than just access to health care while still acknowledging that health care will play a role in that. Thank you. Um, accepting as we must that um, those four concepts have all got a role to play and there might be a difference in how in what weight is given to each of those concepts in different parts of the system. Um, I suppose yeah. if we drill into that um, uh, in a system of limited resources and in a system where we have to treat more than one person um, and system where um, different people come into the system and hopefully progress through recovery, what kind of emphases would those concepts be or should they be given at different points in the system between on the one hand hospital, on the other hand primary care and in between? Is it possible to say that? It's very difficult just before I move into it and ask you the question, it's very difficult, of course, to and expensive to have a system which creates at full volume each of those availabilities. How's it to be rational? Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I um, you know, I think that it's the, that they become, uh, uh, do become questions of design. I suppose that one of the reasons it's really important for me to emphasise the psychosocial the occupational and the relational elements. And some of these things don't necessarily cost any money. The evidence is that it's actually informal relationships. It's how do I make friends? Uh, a common question you might ask somebody would be, if you've got a problem, who would you talk to? Um, how we might support people to be able to widen out and develop their friendship networks is a really, really important part of recovery. And it's not actually something that costs much money. And here, for example, I want to call out the work of an organisation such as INIAC that's been doing great work at, at, it's not just their advocacy platform, it's not just the sort of practical help seeking that they're doing, but actually they're a really important organisation for people to find identity, meaning, and relationships in. Um, and it, that's not necessarily about spending a lot of money in doing it. Pretty similarly, if I pick up the ways in which we might think about actually ensuring that we've got pathways into employment, the, the, the reality is that many of our employment schemes are quite hard and difficult for people, particularly people with severe mental illness, to actually navigate. When I was at Mind, we were doing a project with some employment providers to really help people think about and engage in meaningful activity. Um, because employment both gives us structure, it gives us purpose. That's probably the, one of the most powerful pathways out of poverty that our patients will face. Um, and, and yet uh, we don't give enough thought to what are the system design issues that encourage and interface into the employment, into the employment facing. So 
what I what I would suggest to the commission that some of these aren't all necessary. You know, building more beds, having more workers, very expensive. But sometimes actually just thinking about navigation, small adjuncts to systems. There's been uh, I'm aware of some services, for example, who have found room for employment consultants within their area mental health services to really support employment outcomes a relatively cheap and very effective intervention for actually supporting people's recovery. Um, uh, so I, I do think that, it, that, that this speaks and connects to both the issue of system integration and system navigation, because if we get the design right, we can lever off what's already there for people, not necessarily replicate or spend a lot of money doing it. Thank you. If I could ask you just one further hard question, I apologise that it's hard, but um, if, if accepting that supports to do with um, access to enabling um, people to develop um, vocational skills and access to employment and so on can be very important, and if it can't be that it's at every point of the system where there's access to that, and you've referred to the fact that employment consultants have been, you're aware of an employment consultant being available in an area, in particular area of mental health service, is that the proper place for that kind of support? Um, if you couldn't have that kind of support everywhere, where's the best place for it? Look, it would, it would really surprise you. We have people who are currently within Tom Assembly Hospital going out to work. Inpatients of Tom Assembly Hospital who have jobs. Equally, in some of our consultant work, we are increasingly looking at the use of current patients of ours, paying them as consultants to do work for us. Um, of course, of course, it's easy to see that the proportion of people further down the chain, if you like, um, uh, there's more opportunity. But certainly, if I were working with young people, it probably wouldn't matter how sick that person was. The issue of either education or employment, keeping meaningful purpose, would have to be absolutely essential to the work that we do. Spending 40 years on a disability support pension uh, really has terrible kind of long-term outcomes, at least in the area of poverty and your ability to engage in the kind of community. So again, I think that there are, there are opportunities for us within um, a healthcare setting, and I don't want to diminish, you know, I probably sell healthcare um, for a job. You know, I run a hospital, I run tertiary services, and they're important and they're expensive and we need them but we need a system design that recognises across all of that continuum that people's lives are more and people need more than just access to healthcare. Perhaps that was one of the most important lessons five years in an NGO really taught me. And it taught me a lot more about the capabilities of people. And again, this is where I want to speak back to the culture of the, the um, uh, uh, the culture of mental health services, where sometimes our beliefs in what we think people are capable of doing and the lives they're able to live are really kind of overshadowed by our own sense of negativity. Um, our own sense sometimes of the hopelessness of the churn of people through acute uh, systems. I've seen 31 people sitting in an emergency department in acute need for me, looking at very unwell prisoners sitting in prison who were unable to um, provide effective treatment for. Um, and uh, one of the other really important aspects of recovery, this con the concept of hope, is a really important concept, I think, to actually apply to our system. And for me, one of the per important opportunities of the Commission is its ability to give hope to those of us within the system so that we can see that it's possible for people to live different lives to the lives that we're living today. Thank you. Mr Kelly, moving to you, um, your statement talks about um, 
the continuing care model versus the episodic care model. And you also have experience of um, uh, a model in New Zealand which provides five levels of support. If I might ask you in talking about that space between hospitals on the one hand and primary care on the other, if you can speak to both of those concepts. Just, I've lost my train of thought. The first uh, part of the question. The first part of the question was the observations that you've made concerning Northwestern mental health's experience of the um, continuing model of care as opposed to the episodic model of care, model, uh, model of care which you've described in your statement as harmful. Um, and that being a model of care which you have experience of and can speak to. And you've also spoken um, uh, in the conclave concerning your observations of the system in New Zealand, which has five different levels of care, and, uh, which is, they're not the same thing, but I'd like no. you to speak to both of those topics if possible in, this, in the, this general setting of how does one approach what needs to happen between hospitals on the one hand and primary care on the other? Okay, uh, it, it's probably helpful to go back to the early 1990s, which was probably recognised as the sweet spot in the Victorian mental health system, where it appeared at least to be adequately funded and adequately resourced to do its job. And at that time, the community clinics, the adult community clinics, were known as continuing care teams uh, because they provided continuing care. But over time, as the population has grown and services have become overwhelmed, we've had to move towards an episodic care model. Um, and what that means is that people cycle through that clinic, our clinics in a, in a sort of a, um, acute unwell, recovery, uh, stability, relapse, recovery sort of cycle. Um, and for people with a severe and enduring mental illness, that is harmful. Uh, because particularly for people with psychotic disorders, each time a person has a psychotic breakdown, that, that individual experiences a minor cognitive decline, and each of those uh, cognitive declines build one upon the other and over time uh, degrade the person's level of, of functioning. So we've moved to an episodic model, not out of desire, but out of need to try and do the most good for the most people. And what that means is that each week or each month or each year, we have to have the same number of people exiting the clinic or the caseload as have entered. Otherwise, the inevitable uh, outcome is you end up with a waitlist uh, system, which we've never uh, embraced, uh, because I think uh, that just uh, is, is a sort of a harmful space for people to be in as well. Um, so I suppose what I'm saying is that the, the old system of continuing care recognised that people who had a severe and enduring mental illness often needed lifelong care, or at least longer than they get now under the episodic care model. Thank you. You've observed in New Zealand, oh, sorry, before I, uh, I move to that, you've um, uh, observed that part of the problem is once episodic care has been provided by your service, often a consumer will then plummet, if you like, back into the hands of a GP at best. And that's the difficulty in the space of this, in the space between that I've described between hospital on the one hand and primary care on the other. And you've observed um, uh, a system in New Zealand which has five levels of care. I wonder if you can speak to the, how that works. Yeah, the New Zealand model particularly related to, to consumers with a severe and enduring mental illness who needed residential care support. So it was, it was specific to that um, uh, area where people mostly who had schizophrenia or long-term bipolar affective disorder that needed um, um, support to move into independent living graduated through a system level five through to level one. Level five was akin to our sort of community key units here in Victoria where there was uh, 24 hour staffing uh, through to level one, which was effectively independent living with inreach from a non-clinical provider. And that system seemed to work very effectively when I, when I worked in New Zealand back in uh, the late 1990s, early 2000s. Can I just get you to populate the fourth third and second levels as well for the two. Well, they, they were just graduated levels of support. So apart from having, you know, if you take the CCU example where, where you've got staff on site 24 seven, you might move to a system where you have staff working two shifts with a sleepover and then one shift and then a sort of a, um, a, a group of consumers living in a block of flats, for instance, that have been converted for this purpose with inreach into that block of flats and then finally moving person into, into independent accommodation. Thank you. Before I move away from you, the, um, uh, uh, one of the issues that's been identified, and uh, Ms Anderson made reference to it, is the idea of the hospital without walls. 
and if you like treatment in the home and you've made mention of the 1990s and there being if you like assertive outreach or what were then said to be called cat teams which um uh, I, I gather from what you've said, you'd regard that as having been a successful feature of the system at that time, um, albeit a system that's been degraded somewhat since, but also an expensive element of the system. Before we could talk about the expense of it, what about the efficacy of it and the success of it? Are you able to say anything about that? Yeah, it was, it was efficacious and it was uh, very palatable to consumers and carers because we were providing home-based assessment and treatment uh, to people in, a, in, a, in an area where they, you know, in a location where they felt comfortable and supported and often had their loved ones around them. Um, ironically, the success of that program led to its demise in the sense that it just couldn't keep up with the pace of the work. I did that job for two years back in the early uh, 1990s. Um, uh, it, initially, those teams had two functions. They were doing assessment and treatment. And in the end, they could do neither function well. Um, we ended up with caseloads on our treatment board of up to 30 or 35 consumers uh, spread over a large geographic area. And in the end, it just became impossible to maintain that, to maintain the quality of it. And it was more than just dropping off and giving people medication. It recognised that we were dealing with people with the full gamut of mental illnesses, people who had lifelong and enduring mental illness, people who were having a single psychotic episode due to illicit drug use, for instance, people uh, presenting with suicidal ideation in the context of a situational crisis. So you offered the full range of supports to those people to deal with the crisis. It was, they were called crisis teams for a reason. So crisis theory was applied. And in other words, you tried to understand what the symbolic meaning of the crisis was for the person. You tried to uncover their internal resources and see what had sustained them in previous uh, instances of crisis. Uh, you tried to build on those and get the person emerging from that with a higher level of functioning. So if you take the example of someone with a situational crisis due to gambling problem, for instance, where perhaps they were about to lose the family home, the mortgage was about to be foreclosed, uh, the, 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 the marriage or the relationship was starting to fall over as a consequence of that, and really their whole world had started to tumble down, then you start to unpack that and put in place the appropriate resources, whether it's gambler's help assistance, financial counselling, relationship counselling, uh, immediate crisis accommodation if that's required, as well as the medical treatment. So it wasn't like the medical treatment was the absolute focus of it. It was, it was one of a number of elements of care that was being uh, provided to that individual and indeed their families at that point in their life. Accepting that that, oh, sorry, Peter. Um, uh, <laughs> Sorry, Mr. <laughs> Kelly. <laughs> um, accepting that the system that you're speaking to, I think, is a conceptually a sort of 24-7 type system. Is that right? In those days, in the early 90s, it wasn't 24-7. It ran two shifts per day, seven days a week, with an on-call function uh, overnight. And largely, the on-call function was uh, to respond to people presenting in crisis, either at police stations or in emergency departments. And, is and that again, sorry. Sorry, is that an effective way of running a system like that to, to give emphasis to particular periods with on-call at other times? What's the alternative? I've spoken this morning about 31 patients sitting in emergency departments, very busy emergency departments, occupying resuscitation bays at enormous cost, uh, draining enormous resources in an unfriendly, unsuitable environment. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's highly cost-effective. Um, how did the system operate for example, in rural or regional areas? I can't really comment on that because I was, I was based here in the, uh, the inner west uh, out at St Albans. But in fact, we travelled out as far as Melton, Bacchus Marsh and up as far as Sunbury. Um, so a pretty large geographical area. But I, I, I fully concede that uh, uh, operating in that environment is very different to operating at Mildura, for instance. Thank you. Um, uh, Dr Grigg, I might go to you on this topic of um, different, innova uh, different innovations and uh, that can uh, populate that space between the hospitals on the one hand and primary care on the other. And we've been given the example of these crisis assessment teams which have been differently described. And I'll, uh, if I can ask you about those while we're trying to get Ms Anderson back onto the call. Certainly. Um, so uh, like Peter, uh, uh, I was involved in crisis teams. I managed a crisis team in the inner city in what I think was the early 2000s. I have to do my timing. It always feels a long time ago. Um, 
I, I, there's absolutely no doubt that they were important. There's a question of what's the contemporary look of them look like today, which I think is, is important. Um, but that issue of being able to provide people with options for intense treatment at home, you know, the ability, as Peter said, to actually uh, provide a broad range of interventions because they were multidisciplinary things. Um, so you were able to provide broader psychosocial input if needed. Um, the ability to um, potentially visit somebody up to three times in a day. The ability, the ability to um, uh, to really um, go at all times of the day be on call. I've had a little bit of experience of the teams in rural communities and they did operate a little bit differently, but often kind of really effectively in terms of being able to provide. And I do think that there is opportunities to learn from crisis settings of which they are well established in a whole range of other jurisdictions. You'll find a number of evaluations of and think about what a contemporary design of them might be if we think about a hospital without walls or a hospital um, at home. Um, and I would say that really other parts of healthcare are really actively looking at these models of care, of being able to deliver where possible um, services to a person at home rather than necessarily bringing them into a hospital. So, so I see that they have to be a really important part of some future design. Accepting that um, uh, an, an approach of that kind uh, has um, demonstrated his benefit historically, and as you've identified, it's a, there, the question is how that is to be approached in a contemporary and modern setting. What do you see as being the issues in imagining um, crisis teams in a modern setting? Well, they're, they're probably pretty similar. Uh, what's the scope of the crisis team? So what's the, what's the balance between um, uh, assessment and treatment? So what's the options, as Peter said, as demand for these services grew without resources, more and more work went into assessment, much less went into treatment options to keep people at home. Um, how do you use them potentially to support people as they leave hospitals? So that step down option, as well as uh, preventing hospitalisation. What are the interface issues? Um, and so again, they started getting quite complex design issues when a lot of resources went into emergency department. As we reminded more and more people turning up to emergency departments. But increasingly, so now we've got the, um, I can never remember the new name for the PACER initiative, but the police and mental health workers doing some of that. Um, Barwon have been doing a trial around ambulance and kind of mental health workers. And so you do have to sort of navigate what some of those interface issues might look like, because what you don't want is five different services delivering Pretty similar, uh, uh, pretty similar services because that um, uh, that gets that gets pretty inefficient. I do think the opportunity to think about what virtual care might look like and how we may much more use technology effectively. And so, for example, I was just talking to one of our own teams about how we might simply use text me messaging. There's you know, in um, uh, our follow up for people who have made a suicide attempt, we know the importance of follow up of the person after they've left the emergency department here, the, how effective that is in reducing the likelihood of a future suicide attempt. But that follow up doesn't always have to be for face to face. You will find really innovative programs where, for example, people are sending regular text messages. Have you done this? Have you thought about this? everything going okay. So I, I, I do think in design, there's also the real opportunity to think about the ways in which we use technology in a contemporary space um, as well, and not always have to rely on, um, on it being delivered in a face-to-face in a -face type fashion. Yeah, 
Thank you. Can I go to a topic which was discussed last week about which there was a difference of views, albeit a very good natured one, which was the role of security extended care units and you expressed yes. some views about that. Yes. Yeah. So uh, uh, I don't think Peter and I, um, uh, Peter and I completed the conversation because I think many of the references he made was really about work they've done about their own individual secure extended care. But if I were to step back and look at them as a system of care, both from my experience in the department, but also from my experience here, I'd, I'd make three observations. One is there is often excess demand for those services. So um, uh, many of the services uh, uh, receive a lot more referrals for people than there are available. The second observation I would make probably aligns a little bit to what Peter said in his um, witness statement. That is the level of security and their ability in particular to manage quite complex behaviours, including occupational violence. So I think at any given time, we have three to four admissions of quite uh, people being referred to us from the civil system with quite complex behaviours who are unable to be contained in the secure extended care system, but for which we don't have capacity. And some of that's really about how we might think about um, actually what the design and model of care in those facilities that give rise to its ability to much more effectively um, manage um, uh, uh, behaviours of concern including, I think, some of the complex issues associated with disability. The third issue that I might raise is really their kind of recovery orientation and the level of amenity sitting in them. So the extent to which the services sit about kind of containing people and hope that, you know, something happens with their illness to get things better. Because often the often the environments themselves have really um, limited interfaces with broader, with broader psychosocial environments. So they are frequently sitting on acute hospital campuses where there's very little outdoor space, for example, where the abilities to connect into a community safely <coughs> are limited. And so, I do think that there, I do think that there are real opportunities as we think about that that very small but really important group of people with quite complex needs, many many of whom we are seeing really cycle through prisons, you know, or moving between homelessness in and out of inpatient units, uh, sometimes having done periods in uh, uh, secus. Um, that the, the current models of care that we've got for that group of people more broadly, I think at the moment, aren't really very effective. So, but less of a comment on Peter's individual sector service. Just before I come to you on that topic, uh, Mr Kelly, uh, I'd like to welcome back Ms Anderson um, and ask her about the importance of um, longitudinal care. I opened up this topic by asking Mr Kelly about um, uh, continuing as opposed to um, uh, episodic care. But Ms Anderson, if you can talk about the importance of care over time, or as, as you've described it, longitudinal care. Really important. For me, it um, took from uh, acute mental illness to a really stable recovery phase 10 years. And in that 10 years, I accessed... Um, supported housing and support, um, psychosocial supports, clinical care, and, um, and just um, managing, self-managing my illness. And part of that was after my acute episode is to really uh, discern what type of care I needed and what type of care that I needed going forward. And part of that was volunteering, getting stable employment, 
having my peers around me and getting peer support, though in an informal way, because there was no peer support programs then, and able to access the care I need. Um, it, it was a really, um, I was very fortunate to be able to do that. You refer in your statement to um, the experience you had when you sp first spoke to Nimai National um, uh, and you were asked questions about how you were and that set you on a recovery path. I wonder if you can speak to that because it seems that from that point, the kind of supports that you've described beca then became supports that um, you were able to access and were available to you. I wonder if you can tell the Commission about that. Yeah, I was... Um People only spoke to me about um, my medication and what I should be doing clinically and not about my life and where it was going and what dreams, what hopes and dreams I had. And so when I spoke to Nimai, um, the question was put to me, what's happened to you? It wasn't about my case. It wasn't about medication. It wasn't about, it was about, it was a personal question about my life and where I wanted to go. And so the supports I received from them were strengths based. So they did exercises with me about what my strengths were. They supported me in, um, in being a mother. They supported me in um, maintaining my housing. They supported me in um, doing budgeting. Um, all those things uh, took time. It took time for, to sink in, but it was reinforced time and time again, together with my clinical support. So I think it's important it's not one or the other. I think you need both the clinical support and the psychosocial support together. And it takes a long time. I um, took up some volunteering. The opportunity was to take up volunteering, which led to employment for me. So I was very fortunate. We've heard from Dr. Grigg that it might be that the emphasis between the clinical emphasis, uh, support on the one hand and non-clinical supports of the kind that you've described on the other might be different at different stages or phases of illness. Was that your own experience, that there was an emphasis upon clinical at one point and an emphasis upon the non-clinical at other points? And if so, um, is there a role in the system for reflecting that emphasis? The emphasis on the clinical support was when I was acutely unwell. Um, but other than that, going through my phases of illness and relapse, um, the emphasis was on clinical support. But the psychosocial support came in fairly quickly and they worked hand in hand. They worked together, so they worked in tandem. Um, it wasn't one or the other. Thank you. Uh, uh, before I move away from you, Ms Anderson, have you got... Um, some other observations concerning some of the topics. I'm conscious that you've been on the system at one point, you were off the system at another, and so I'm not quite sure what you missed. Um, but you might not know what you missed either, so by all means you can ask me, or you can comment upon that which you um, uh, saw, but that I'm not conscious that you saw, because you were, I don't know whether you were on the system or not at the time. No, I was off the system for quite a few minutes. Um, I just like to emphasise the um, the importance of peers in the recovery process, and especially in the in between referring times. So, in between, say, in a hospital stay and the time that lapses before being referred to a GP, that you have that personal connection with somebody along the journey. And you've got in mind particularly. A Peer workers, is that correct? Yes, peer support workers. Thank you. Um, I, know, I understand that I'm entirely changing the topic a bit here, um, Mr Kelly, but I'm going back to your experience and observations concerning the SECU in Sunshine um, in order that you can give the perspective upon the operation of that service, which I raised the, the operation of SECU services in a general sense with Dr Grigg, but I'll allow you to um, explain to the Commission how the SECU in Sunshine operates? Well, firstly, I'm extraordinarily proud of the work that's done at the SECU at Sunshine. It's been operating for over 20 years. It's a professorial unit. It's headed up by Professor Christos Pantelis, who's a world-renowned expert in the area of uh, treatment-resistant psychosis. Um, I think the name is a bit of a misnomer in the sense that they're not really secure. They're probably less secure than our acute inpatient units, to be honest. Um, 
the original mandate of the SECUs was to treat people with treatment resistant psychosis. And um, uh, I mean, this might sound odd, but uh, up until quite recently, we've had three consumers at the Sunshine SECU or the Adult Mental Health Rehab Unit as it's known, that had been there for over 10 years. Um, so they, they certainly had a refractory illness that couldn't be managed in the community. And if we go back 30 years, uh, these are the sort of folks that would have been in long-term institutional care. Um, the, the current length of stay in our SECU is close to nine months. And so typically consumers who are referred into the SECU have a treatment resistant psychosis, but with a whole number of layers of complexity. Often there's a forensic overlay, there's an illicit substance use overlay, there's often an intellectual disability or an autistic spectrum disorder, um, and, and there's, there's a myriad of social problems in terms of housing and, and so on. Uh, typically what the team will do is, is conduct a file review and oftentimes the type of consumers being referred into the service have 15 to 20 volumes of medical records. So they'll go through those records from uh, top to tail and really just try and understand the person's treatment history in a much more uh, detailed and profound way. They'll often wash out the medications that the person is on and, and, and start afresh, but also conduct a very detailed organic workup. In other words, they'll try and see if there's an underlying physical cause for the person's uh, mental state, recommence medications and, and, and try and stabilise the person's uh, mental illness. And so typically that process now takes about, about nine months. So throughput is slow and there are simply more referrals than there are beds available. And I, it w I think it would be a fair comment to say that SECUs are not um, uh, all of the same standard or run to a consistent model uh, across Victoria. And I'm not being disparaging by that. They're all set up slightly differently, have different levels of infrastructure, etc. What has emerged in recent times is a push for the SECUs to admit and care for a cohort of consumers referred through the Vixa uh, Victorian Fixated Threat Assessment Centre. So these are people that have um, radicalised views, uh, that have been caught up in the uh, criminal justice system, and about... Uh, uh, a large percentage of these folks that engage in these sort of behaviours have a mental illness either diagnosed or not. Um, so these are the type of referrals that we are starting to see now on top of uh, the chronic treatment resistant uh, type presentations. They are certainly recovery face, uh, focused units. Um, we're, we're extraordinarily proud of the work that our staff do in the SECU at Sunshine. Thank you. Can I move to a different topic? And I'm really raising two slightly different things, but one concerns, and you have some experience of this, the role of the private system and the relationship between the public and private systems and the, the, the um, uh, benefits that there might be in a relationship with access to the private system. And also moving to the issue I identified right at the outset, which is specialisation, which you have experience in your, in your own service, some degrees of specialisation, and the extent to which that can be regional, statewide, local or other, when we're talking about the kinds of um, streaming that there are streaming services that there might be um, that were mentioned right at the outset, eating disorders and the like. I wonder if you could speak to those two issues and then I'll move from there to uh, Dr. Greer. I suppose in my statement, what I, what I referred to was the symbiotic uh, nature of the relationship between the private and the public system. Uh, many psychiatrists who work in the public system also want a mix of private work. Um, if we go back about 15 years ago, I think uh, we recognised uh, that there was a real uh, maldistribution of private psychiatrists west of the Maribyrnong River in, in, uh, in Melbourne. And so we set about developing two private consulting suites, one at Harvester Clinic in Sunshine and the other at 130 Bell Street in Coburg. And we, what we wanted to do was provide opportunities for psychiatrists working in the public system to also do private work. And ideally, that consumers that we were treating in the public system would migrate through to those private psychiatrists and have a continuity of care in that way, but also building in an easy re-entry back into the system if the private psychiatrist is no longer able to meet the needs of that person. In other words, if they became acutely unwell, could they be referred quickly and easily back into the public system? And that, that model has been very successful. One, we've retained a lot of private psychiatrists in the public system that otherwise would have moved into full-time private practice. And secondly, um, we have now got 8,000 uh, consumers registered across those two private practices. 
Now, I'm not trying to mislead you. That's a mixture of, of, of consumers who have migrated from the public system, but it's also allowing the private psychiatrists to do the sort of work that they might also feel stimulating and interesting and, and uh, accords with their, with their subspecialty training, whether it be eating disorders or neuropsychiatry or what have you. Thank you. Dr. Greer, um, the answer, the, uh, if you like, unlocking the potential for um, the uh, private system on the one hand, and um, uh, access to or links to specialised or streamed services on the other, how, how can this problem best be approached? Um, so I think, I think it's a really important question. The public-private interfacing in mental health is quite different to the public-private interface in many other areas of health, where the degrees of overlap between the two of them are much greater. And so, while there's good examples such as Peter describes of the work done in Northwest, largely that's pretty kind of marginal and both systems, both um, in the context of hospital care, in the context of psychiatry, but also increasingly in access to psychological services are operating in silos. And I think that uh, there'd probably be a couple of comments that I'd make here. I think that it's important in a system design sense for us to think about what incentives we're putting in place in the public system to better leave it into the private system. Um, initiatives such as Peter's are good examples. There are public services that have been looking at developing relationships, for example, with private hospitals, uh, that both formally such as Mercy, health, but also informally St Vincent's has always had a relatively strong relationship with health scope. Um, so thinking about those, um, but I would note that there's a great opportunity, the Productivity Commission report is soon to come out. Um, there are at the moment, I think, really good opportunities for the federal and state government to work together. There does need it to be a degree of harmonisation at the state and federal level if we're really to realise as much intersection between the two. Um, because, uh, uh, probably the other thing I'd say, which I really think is worth having a look at, so if we think about COVID, and I go to a completely different discipline area such as intensive care, Peter's made a couple of reference to it. So there's always been a capacity for public patients to be admitted in intensive care when there's an absolute capacity overrun, but it's been very limited, very marginal. COVID saw major shifts in the role of private health services in the delivery of public health care, including in the access to both um, access to both intensive care capacity within the private system um, and uh, elective surgery. And these came out of unprecedented cooperation between the state and federal government to solve a problem in front of them, which says to me, I think this loops back to the innovation of COVID, which is not just on the ground innovation of activity, but actually showed that complex kind of policy gaps between various levels of government are possible to address if there's a will to do so. Um, and it certainly increased my, um, uh, my kind of line of sight in the ability to think about in some future state what is a different role of private hospitals? How can we lever in and access much more effectively I do want to keep private psychology in the loop as well as private psychiatry. It's become increasingly important. Um, and there's probably, there's probably no better time than now for us to be ambitious in our thinking about what that could look like. Thank you. Ms Anderson, can I go to you about the importance of specialisation and access to specialty services and also um, if you have any experience of it, um, private or knowledge of it, private providers. Um, thanks. Uh, it's specialisation um, 
in certain, you can access specialised services if you're in certain catchments. And if you're not in the right catchment at the right time, you don't, you're not able to access some of those specialised services. Um, so I, I don't know what the answer, I think it is with specialised services mm -hmm. that you should be able to cross catchments if there's a specialised service in a, in a different I also think that, um, sorry, what was the second part of the question? About access to the private system. I'm very lucky I have a private psychiatrist that bulk bills, that's very rare, but without that relationship over the 10 years with that private psychiatrist, I don't think I'd be where I am today. So I think the private hospitals are underutilised. I think in agreement with the, um, with the federal government that there should be some sort of more agreement around the use of private hospitals and also more Medicare benefits for private psychiatrists to bulk bill. Thank you. Um, Mr. Kelly, Northwestern Mental Health's got uh, a partnership with some private hospitals. I wonder if I can ask you to speak to that. Certainly. The, the department or the government has recognised the shortage of beds across the north and west of Melbourne and as an interim strategy has funded us to purchase three beds each at the Melbourne Clinic, North Park Private Psychiatric Hospital and Wyndham Clinic. So nine beds in total um, uh, we, can, we can access. And I, I started off this morning by talking about the 31 patients in the emergency department. Yet out of those nine beds, we've only got eight occupied at the moment. So there is a, a threshold issue around risk um, that the privates are able to admit up to and then not beyond. So it's sort of an interesting comment, isn't it, that we talk about sometimes that hospitalisation is not required, yet uh, I've got people queued up in emergency departments and yet they're all too risky to go into a private bed at one of those, one of those hospitals. The other comment I'd make about the privates is that their model of care typically in these arrangements with us is for a 28-day admission against our nine-day average at Northwestern Mental Health. Now, you could ask yourself, well, why is that so? Uh, why 28 days, not 21 days or 14 days? And it's probably linked to the, the sort of caps on, on, on what, the, what the funds will pay out. So, in other words, at the end of 28 days, uh, the person is discharged back into the primary care sector. Um, we, we have sought to try and drive down um, those lengths of stay to get them more commensurate with ours. But on the other hand, you could say, well, actually, it's the perfect length of stay for someone with an acute mental illness, and they'll do everything that's required in that 28 days, and that's perfect. We can't match it, though. Thank you. Um, uh, going back to you, Dr. Grigg, on you introduced or referred to the issue of virtual resources and virtual care. Can I ask you to introduce that topic on a broader um, setting, what do you see as the role for virtual care in the different phases of the system, if you like, um, potentially? Look, I think, I think that there is a, um, there is a wide, so firstly is to say, um, there are very, very limited contexts in which I think virtual care replaces face-to-face -face care. Um, but nevertheless, as an adjunct into the system, we are seeing um, enormous innovations in the use of a range of technologies, um, both in terms of um, uh, uh, triage, access, accessing um, treatment, uh, creating communities, um, communities of interest. Same Australia, for example, has done doing some great work around in a virtual environment, really creating a place where people with um, uh, senses of shared experience can come together. You can look at the amazing work I think being done by Headspace in the treatment models. Um, but we can even get very, very innovative and look at some of the hospitals in the US who are now using avatars as part of their suicide assessment process. So um, when people turn up to an emergency department and a couple of EDs, that you actually can have an avatar for your suicide assessment instead of seeing a face-to-face -face clinician. And we need to recognise, then one might think about the way in which Ambulance Victoria is using uh, virtual reality as a training tool for its staff in better managing occupational violence. Just, but the 
I think that there is a big space for us to be thinking about the ways in which in mental health care, the um, technology in its broadest sense um, provides us with real opportunities to supplement and adjust our models of care so that they're able to be much more personalised and person dependent, um, which is probably a different view because it's balanced over here with their kind of cheap and they take people away from the interaction and they increase their sense of loneliness and disconnection from the world. Uh, the reality is both those experiences of it are the same, nevertheless. I think it's going to be a really important place for us to think about. Thank you. Um, so far this morning, you've given, all of you have given some evidence about the bed based system and experiences both here and in New Zealand and other places concerning that. Dr. Griggs just talked about virtual possibilities. There's been reference to CAT teams. There's been reference to um, uh, other elements of the system, such as private sector. And we'll come to the issue of moving or navigation between the various elements um, shortly. But one of the areas that we haven't yet discussed us, which each of you discuss in your statements is um, the uh, community-based um, uh, mental health system or for that matter what have been described in some of the statements as hubs and um, uh, Ms Anderson you've described them in your statement as uh, as uh, particularly as psychopolises so yeah. I wonder if you can talk about that. Yeah psychopolis to me is a term that that donates that all mental health services are in one place and only mental health patients go to that mental health service and it just becomes a, like a psychopolis, a mini institution. I think um, community-based care should be open to the community, whether it's with mental health, physical illness or whatever. It shouldn't just be based on a mental health diagnosis. It should be based on community care for, for the whole community. Thank you. Do you have any other uh, uh, observations concerning that model of care and benefits in it? I think the benefits of hubs is is around community care, whether you can go and you can um, be, have the dietitian talk to your mental health clinician or the diabetes educator talk to your mental health clinician. I think that's a benefit. I think that the, the holistic care that you could receive at a community hub would be re really um, beneficial. So you don't have to tell your story over and over again and go to 20 different appointments at 20 different locations. But I think um, we have to be careful that it's not stigmatized just for um, people with mental health issues, it's open to the whole community. Thank you. Uh, Mr Kelly, you've um, referred in your statement to the way in which such a hub might work and you've made reference to the, um, it's not called a hub, but it is nonetheless of this kind of style of um, service in Melton. And I wonder if you could start by identifying the kinds of services that are available there, how it's been operating and, and the issue of thresholds gaining access to that service. Well, firstly, I agree with uh, Julie. I don't think it's necessarily helpful to have a mental health hub per se, but to have mental health services located in a hub with lots of other services that can assist people that require them. So we've, over the last uh, nine months or so, uh, located a service out at Melton. So uh, the it's the outer team from Midwest Area Mental Health Service. It's located in the Jarrawarra Health Service um, uh, Community Services Hub there. Uh, and there are a myriad of, uh, of, of services co-located. So Jarrawarra Health Service, where they've got dietetics, um, podiatry, dentistry services. Um, there's a social housing agency located there as well. Um, there's a, um, a community justice uh, centre. Um, so I think th the intention is to build up these sort of services so that people can effectively be easily linked and referred and easily access services such as community housing, Centrelink, all of those services that people struggle uh, to navigate their way, their way through. Um, it, it's, a, it's a helpful and useful model. It's, it's palatable to consumers. Uh, but of course, the big question arises, well, what is the threshold for entry and receipt of services? And, you know, as we've all been discussing, the threshold just continues to rise in a sense. And um, so at some point, you'd have to think that services would be means tested or, or otherwise uh, rationed. Uh, 
uh, because they can become too palatable, too accessible. Is it presently the case that the service is rationed in Melton? Oh, well, our service is rationed, absolutely. And what does one need to, um, what's the qualification for gaining access to the Melton service? The mental health service? Yeah. Well, it's a, it's a level of risk and disability, I, I guess, and so have a serious and enduring mental illness, a uh, level of risk and a level of uh, disability that, that uh, are, the, are the hurdles that uh, uh, have, to be, have to be crossed. You've uh, to other potential uh, qualifiers, if you like. Let's take as an example pension card. What are the benefits or um, disadvantages in particular, and you've identified the one that's actually being implemented, which is, if you like, a sense of a, a degree of acuity. What are the benefits or otherwise of um, approaching thresholds in these various ways? Well, it's it's interesting in the in the context of COVID-19, you, you, you may be aware that um, Associate Professor Ruth Vine has been appointed as the um, uh, Chief Mental Health Officer for the Commonwealth. Uh, that's come on the back of modelling from the Commonwealth Department of Health that shows that more people will die by suicide as a consequence of COVID-19 than will die from the pandemic itself. And we're starting to see some of this uh, need uh, presenting in our in our community clinics and indeed in our inpatient units and emergency departments right now. So, for instance, the you know the the family in Melton that had two both partners working. Uh, they've now both lost their jobs, their accommodation's under threat. They won't be pension card holders, but they will be struggling. And so I think having arbitrary sort of measures like pension card or means testing uh, will, will uh, disadvantage many people that are caught up in this, this uh, profound and rapid social change that's occurring now as a consequence of the economic downturn. Thank you. Dr. Greg. you've made some observations concerning the benefits of hubs and the kinds of... Um, uh, uh, disciplines that might best be available in that kind of setting. I wonder if I can ask you to speak to that model. I think that I said uh, uh, it depends what we mean by a hub, some sort of geographical presence. I would share um, I would share Peter and Julie's concerns about just identifying something for mental health while also noting, noticing in a broad sense that a platform such as Headspace has actually been destigmatizing rather than stigmatizing. You know, I was I was struck when my own nieces and nephews, you know, who wouldn't talk about anything to do with mental health but would turn up for headspace. So it was seen as a non-stigmatized place to go. So um, we should also think about these from the context of stigma and from the and from our opportunities to reduce stigma rather than increase it. Um, uh, fundamentally, uh, fundamentally, though, uh, in the context of having a geographical place where there's an identity for people to go, those functions of triage processes and entry and how you set thresholds, um, I have to say again, I, I think that there's um, there's both been a demand there's been demand elements in mental health. I think there's cultural elements in mental health in terms of the, the hoops that uh, we sometimes ask people to go out, go through before, um, before we look at them accessing uh, mental health services and that sometimes those hoops are, are really designed to exclude people rather than ask the question of what have we got here that might help you, which I think is an important cultural element of how we go about working uh, how we go about working with kind of um, triage systems. I think the issue of um, co-location of services for ease of access is really important. And if you design hubs around models of care that create integration and pathways between them rather than silos of services, then that's extremely helpful for people getting a broader range of services. Um, but it needs to be connected to the system navigation issue because I can't imagine the hub that has everything that every person with a mental health problem could possibly want coming into that place. And even if I were to, you know, call that place something like the Alpha Hospital, even then it doesn't have everything. Um, so it's actually also about what we put together, how we create navigation. And I think issues of the navigation about how we also think about virtual hubs um, 
there has been um, whole various um, initiatives over time. They kind of wax and wane about the ways in which you bring local services together to actually create cooperative pathways. I'll say often if you go into rural communities, you'll see these as very living and natural ways of operating um, in ways we can't kind of manage in the city because in communities where just people know each other in different ways and where often there is way less resources than we have sitting in city areas, they've often found really, really creative ways of actually fostering navigation and cooperation and a very real and important role for local governments in actually being the knitting together of those quite local, localised services that people may want to use. Um, just before I go to Ms Anderson on this topic, does it follow from what you've said, Dr Grieve, that um, it, it might be that a service of that kind can look very differently in the city to how it might look in a rural setting? Yes, I, and I would expect it should. And in fact, I might go, it might look different in Western Melbourne than a, what it looks like in the inner east of Melbourne as well. Um, because there are actually really different kind of service systems, relationships between kind of providers. But I will say probably the, one of the unifying elements that, that I think it's worth thinking about is the potential role of, that local government can play and the leadership role that local government can play in really place-based local responses um, to driving and supporting connections between services that helps them facilitate the navigation system. Just before we come to that, and I'll be asking Ms Anderson about that in just a moment, but um, uh, are, would there nonetheless be some degree of essential componentry in each in, in, a, in a hub or community-based mental health service of that kind? It wouldn't be that, um, for example, there'd be no psychiatrist in every in in some ser services, and then would be in others. Or is that what you're saying? Um, so, so I think you're right. I think that there are some critical elements that you go. Uh, you know, there does need to be kind of access to mental health treatment. Uh, potentially, they should all have um, access to substance abuse treatment, given the prevalence of substance use disorders. You might want to say, or oh, given the complexity around housing, housing pathways are really important, and how you, whether you use some sort of in-reach model from your housing providers or something, might equally kind of want to prioritise um, employment. I'm doing this list without a lot of thinking. Uh, so, so I do think it's possible to go kind of here's five or six core elements and different ones might have others. Physical health is probably another one of those core elements, at least some level of primary care in them. So I knew I could think of extra elements if I thought about it. Um, and in a practical, in a in a practical sense, the other initiative that I would at least encourage the Royal Commission to have a look at is the current government's commitment towards the development of community hospitals. So there is an existing commitment for community hospitals as an initiative, particularly in some of the growth corridor areas, and they are still in relatively early period of design. But one could Another way of thinking about these facilities might actually be as very big hub facilities, building on models such as, as Melton, that is a really good opportunity for, you know, again in that way that I, um, it's, it's very important in finding solutions that as much as possible we leverage what exists. Might be a kind of a really good kind of platform to be thinking about, so what so what might design sense might mental health look like in those? I'm no longer close enough to those designs to know actually if that question's been asked. But but I but I think it's a it's an interesting initiative that is already sitting in the system that I think has got some of the aspirations for the broader health system that share 
aspirations into the mental health system. Thank you. Ms. Anderson, can I go to you about the role or the importance of access to physical health in a setting of that kind? It's really important, um, physical health, including dental. A lot of um, consumers don't have good dental hygiene. Um, and um, so diabetes is a problem, obesity is a problem, um, uh, life expectancy of people with mental illness is, is a lot lower than the average life expectancy of people. And so access to physical health services is, is vital along with mental health and that those systems should be talking to each other. It's not, it's not one or, or, or that the uh, mental health team should be talking to people uh, around a person's physical health, make connections with a GP, um, a dietitian, a diabetes educator, a sports physiologist, as well as peer support workers. Just going back to you, Dr. Grigg, you raised the topic of, um, uh, in a sense, and this is in, the, in a, I'm saying this in a colloquial way, but who runs these things? You've given the, or referred to the example of, um, uh, if you like, a community hospital being run by a hospital and that that might be a platform for either access to or also including a community-based mental health uh, uh, hub, if you like. Is, uh, does that, um, uh, does it necessarily follow that such a thing would be um, best run by a hospital and therefore integrated with the hospital system? or is there a better way of, or other ways of approaching this? Uh, well, firstly, I'll say there's a whole range of governance questions around those as is. And um, uh, so it may very well be a hospital owns the infrastructure, may not necessarily run what's within that infrastructure uh, because uh, around, uh, there's a really strong understanding around the issues of chronic disease management that these uh, community hospitals is part of their mandate. Again, in a similar way, the role that social, psychosocial factors play and the desire to actually make sure that there's a strong psychosocial focus within them. So we, we don't mean that, but it is it is a wicked question, the, the question of governance. And um, I feel like uh, 20 years ago, if you had asked me this question, I would be unmoody on the role of health services and in the importance of mainstream in actually the delivery of mental health care. 20 years on um, and with lots of experiences of some of the limitations of mainstreaming, um, what is a much more complex, um, a complex environment for service delivery. Um, I do wonder a little bit more about the opportunity to think about layered and scaled governance options and the ways in which um, a partnership um, is seeded in more structured ways. Um, so that there are stronger levers and directions of government for agencies to join up and connect here um, and to give a tiny, again, a tiny example, I think, of some of the innovation around this that Victoria is experimenting with at the moment is the idea of creating hospital clusters. Firstly, this has been done as part of a COVID response how do you make your intensive care system work? Well, what they did was ask our group of hospitals, public, private, community, and with PHNs, work together in a joined up way and actually deliver a plan, an integrated plan, uh, which in the cluster we're part of, managed to do that in less than four weeks. And I've just been reading it, managed to produce a, actually a 100 page plan that had a whole range of levels of cooperation that I did not really believe was possible. Um, so I do so I do think that increasingly we will need to answer the governance question at multiple levels um, and that we should open up the question of governance 
potential to more flexible options. It may not be a one size fits all, um, but needs are, I quite like, and I, I wrote down that beginning of thinking about what's local, what's regional, what's statewide, because it, it, it needs a fitness, fitness to purpose for scale. Um, but it is actually about how we make those boundaries between our governance agencies both a little bit more permeable and more accountable so that the connections between them work. And I realise that's a pretty kind of rambling statement that sort of goes from, I don't, I, I no longer think there's, there's a single simple answer to the question of governance. Mr Kelly. What do you think about the way this started off with who runs the community based mental health services and 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 then metamorphosized into which is a very big word for the purposes of today, but metamorphosized into um, uh, uh, how the whole system runs. Um, you your your um, services got all kinds of specialties. Like it's linked with the community based mental health system uh, uh, service in Melton and it's got other things as well. Um, uh, I wonder if you can speak to um, the issue of um, uh, the issue of governance that Dr. Griggers introduced. Yeah, uh, I, I would answer the question about which is the best entity to provide that care by asking rhetorically which entity would deliver the best outcomes for people with serious mental illness. I, I, I can tell you that um, about a decade ago, I started to notice some alarming data coming across my desk around the age that consumers in our service were dying of natural causes. So I started uh, maintaining a database. I've got 170 names on that database now. And I can tell you that the average age of death for a consumer in our service that dies of natural causes is 45.7 uh, years if you look at that 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 whole database but if you look at the three commonest causes of death which is cardiovascular disease respiratory disease and cancers of all types then it's 50.1 uh, years now the australian catholic university have just used this data to to um, uh, write an academic paper that's about to be published shortly but uh, julie uh, mentioned before that uh, people with a serious mental illness have reduced life expectancy well according to my numbers it's 30 years less life expectancy uh, and if i just give you the ages of the first 10 people on that list they're, they're alarming and frightening 44 49 42 46 58 57 45 49 48 and 28. you don't see these sort of numbers in the general community so there's something about um, the the access to health care um, that uh, that impacts in a very profound way on people with a severe and enduring mental illness um, and what's alarming in that 170 names on my list is the number of deaths that are recorded after an autopsy and after a toxicology screen as unascertained or undetermined. That's unusual. My previous executive director here, uh, Professor Ruth Vine, took that up with her opposite number at the Victorian Institute of Forensic Medicine. And he felt that uh, if you looked at a similar cohort that died suddenly and unexpectedly in the general community, you would not s expect to see those sort of numbers of undetermined and unascertained deaths. So people with a serious and enduring mental illness cop a raw deal, I think, in the, in the uh, general acute system. There's, there's uh, no doubt in my mind about that. And there, there are alarming numbers and alarming sort of figures about life expectancy. Um, these are often about cancers being diagnosed too late, uh, too late to treat effectively, about people presenting too late in the episode of illness for effective treatment to be provided. Um, I do think it's, it's probably likely that people do receive a level of discrimination in the general acute system if they're seriously mentally ill. Um, and they're, they're just uh, awful numbers related to, you know, cigarette smoking, alcohol use, um, sedentary lifestyle, and I guess um, uh, to some extent, uh, the negative symptoms that come with schizophrenia that leave people sort of um, amotivated and um, uh, with a lack of initiative and drive to to do all the things that we do to try and maintain our health. Thank you. Uh, I'm conscious that with my enthusiasm for today's topic that I've managed to um, uh, overlook the obligatory break that we have in the in the middle of these panels, and I'm not going to have this break um, uh, every time we have a panel, but.
Um, I'd prefer to have it earlier, but why don't we have it now? Ordinarily, for comfort purposes, we would have one, and we can have a break of, say, five minutes and come back and then uh, deal with the question which was raised right at the outset in the opening remarks and has been touched on in various different ways in the course of the panel so far, which is the question of catchment areas. And in doing that, I'll, I'll start with uh, Ms Anderson. But at the moment, let's take five minutes. Um, I introduced uh, Ms Anderson the topic of catchments uh, before we broke, and um, you've expressed some views about the benefits in um, catchments being based in some way upon local government areas. I wonder if I can ask you to commence that topic by um, referring to your views on, the, on that issue. Now, I think catchments should follow local government areas, and I think that's because there's more community accountability through local government, and I think the community should take on some more accountability for mental health issues. Is that from your own experience that you've um, seen the benefits of, if you like, local governance? Um, I have seen the benefits of local governance and that includes um, consumers in that governance. I think it's hard to, for consumers to understand what governance is, both clinical and organisational governance. And I think that there needs to be more effort to include consumers on governance structures. Thank you. Dr. Greg, um, uh, it looks like you're muted at the moment, but by the time I finish speaking, you won't be. Um, uh, uh, the alternative view is, on a, is governance on a broader scale and by reference to catchments that are at the moment hard catchment boundaries or are not hard catchment boundaries. What are the competing views as you see them and what's the preferable view as you see it? Um, it may be that there are multiple government governance options and multiple levels of governance. Um, I'd agree with Julie. I think local government um, uh, has an opportunity to play an important role and we, as a system, may not have levered it as effectively as we can. Um, simultaneously, if we step right up and talk about PKTN catchments, that may be incredibly useful for the purposes of planning. We've then got how governance operates in terms of organisational structures, which is yet another um, uh, another lens into the concept of catchments. We've got what does that lens mean for patient choice? Um, how does how does that framework protect vulnerable consumers to make sure they're able to get access? to services um, and so, and then probably the last element is how do we actually construct governance? Um, really to speak to delivering both, uh, how, do, how do we have a governance structure that connects organisations together to deliver integrated outcomes? Because many of the, we step back into recovery, there probably isn't one organisation that's able to do everything that a person needs or wants or prefers. And the issue is how in a governance sense do we get, do we ensure that organisations work together to deliver the outcomes that matter for, um, uh, for our consumers? Um, I think that's the difficult question when you have the kind of catchment question because typically we see it in a one-dimensional way where, I, where, you know, as I said earlier, I increasingly see it in a much more kind of multifaceted way. And accepting, that, accepting that it's important for the elements of the system to work together and that governance has got an important part to play, what in your view is the best way of facilitating that? Uh, so I do think that it's um, I do think that it's a system design. So if I could get really kind of concrete, for example, it's a question that I'm asking very actively here at um, Thomas Inland. And if I think about the issue of people leaving prison and really needing to be connected up to care, well, the truth is at the moment the system, you know, the governance governance ends for us when they leave prison. The governance doesn't begin till an area mental health service or somebody else has happened 
uh, to accept them into care, and we have this dead space where actually the person is nowhere. Uh, one, of, one of the things that I might think about as an organisation is ask the question of, well, why wouldn't somebody hold us as an organisation or accountable for the person till actually they've been connected in and stabilised into that system? So not even just that point of flat referral, but for example, there might be a KPI that tells me what proportion of people uh, that, that we've been working with who leave prison have actually not only been accepted into a service, has been seen by that service at least three times. I've made up that KPI, overlapping KPIs that provide leaders and governance into connecting and begin to um, begin to hold us jointly responsible for how um, for how care is delivered. Um, because whichever way you design catchments, what we're going to do is have chasms between whatever boundaries we join. And good governance and good accountability at various levels should be watching those joining places as much as they're watching what's happening within them. Thank you. Mr Kelly, do you agree that um, uh, one way of overcoming the uh, a, a fixation, if you like, with catchments is to um, have a good governance um, approach to what operates within and between the, the catchment areas? Yeah, that's one approach. I suppose my question is what, what problem are you trying to fix by uh, abolishing or changing catchments? I mean, if we go right back to the 1980s again, prior to the deinstitutionalised and deinstitutionalisation process, we had the Office of Psychiatric Services, so it was set up as a separate department, the mental health system within the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, mainstreaming occurred because the big institutions closed down and they wanted to provide better access to physical health care and drag mental health system out of the shadows into the mainstream. Uh, has that been an overwhelming success? Well, it's, it's succeeded in many ways, but in other ways it probably hasn't, given the, the conversation we just had about mortality data. Um, so there are a number of ways to organise it. Um, the question is, should they be the catchments the way they are? What's, what's the purpose of a catchment? It's designed for population-based planning, I think. Um, but I think largely the problem is that the planning hasn't kept pace with the population growth. And that's led to serious inequities across the system. In my experience, these discussions are often tied up with consumer choice about which service a consumer can access. I fully support freedom of choice. I think most people will actually choose to go to a service that's convenient to where they live or convenient to where they work. So I think that's absolutely manageable, the freedom of choice in the current system. But the catchment arrangements as they are at the moment are really historically based models that have not kept pace with population growth. Can I raise one last issue um, prior to handing over to the commissioners, because I'm conscious that um, uh, their time is valuable. So to raise one final issue with you, Mr. Kelly, concerning the issue of funding, um, block funding as opposed to, if you like, other forms of funding, activity-based funding, and the focus upon outputs, which you've got a particular view upon. If I can start with you on that issue. Well, at the moment, services are block funded. In other words, they receive, you know, a quanta of, of funding to provide a range of services without um, a, a close accounting of the, the outputs that come with that, apart from uh, recording of service hours. The department and the government have flagged that Victorian mental health system will move to an activity-based funding system. And in fact, I sit on the expert reference group of that, of that committee. It was planned that the activity-based funding would be shadowed in the new financial year uh, with, the, with the block funding model and then implemented the following year. But that's been pushed back, I think, by 12 months because of COVID-19. So moving to a system whereby services are funded uh, by what they do rather than what they'll say they do, I think will be a positive thing because then you can start to exercise the levers about what elements of the service provision do you want provided for each type of patient cohort, for instance. Thank you. Um, uh, Dr. Grigg, do you have similar views about the, um, or not about the uh, benefits of moving to a different funding model? There is absolutely no doubt that there is an urgent need for funding reform in the mental health sector. It is technically difficult. There's been a lot of work done in the activity-based funding model. I, I think the work the department's doing at the moment is very good. It's probably close to some form of bundling of care. 
Um, uh, but it is it is quite technically challenging. And um, I think the other thing um, uh, that to keep an eye on is that largely these funding models are really about allocative efficiency. They're really about how do you decide how do you decide which health service gets the five dollars? Um, my I used to have accountability for this across the border health service system, and I used to really say the funding model is only so I can be equally unfair to everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Can I uh, ask you on this topic about the importance of really <coughs> funding to facilitate outcomes? And that outcomes, of course, are very personal outcomes, as you've spoken of this morning. Um, uh, can you, would you be able to give the commissioners your views about the importance of approaching funding with that kind of uh, focus? Yeah, I think um, it's good to achieve outcomes, but I think the funding, I should have a choice in the funding of what health service I need, or what I want from a health service. So I think that choice, that consumer choice about how the funding's spent is vital. Um, I also think that um, in the whole system, uh, it's not either or. I think you need to have choices around what you access. For example, this pandemic has given me a choice to have phone consultations with my GP. And that's been marvellous because I work and I've got other commitments. But And I never had that choice before. Now, um, another person's choice might be actually to go out to go to a hub because they don't have many interactions in their life. It actually gets them out of the house. They talk to the receptionist. They actually go and talk to some people. So I think multiple strategies around um, consumer choice is, is um, what we should be thinking about. I, I, I'm really offering this, op this opportunity to any member of the panel who might wish to say something on any particular topic that we've covered so far before um, I then um, uh, allow the chair to call upon the commissioners uh, to um, address questions to you. But uh, don't feel constrained that if something's been overlooked that um, Ms Anderson or Mr Kelly, Dr Grigg, anyone um, ha feels that they haven't had the opportunity to say something on an issue of importance, by all means take that opportunity now because um, it's extraordinarily valuable for the purposes of the Commission. Well, the obvious thing for me is that uh, geography and demography are two big uh, issues to consider when, cons when, when conceptualising the size of catchments and how they're resourced. I mean, things like employment levels, workforce skill levels, mean household income, English proficiency, uh, levels of home ownership. There's a whole myriad of social determinants that impact on mental health or mental illness, and that's not equal across metropolitan Melbourne or indeed across Victoria. So it's, 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 it's a much bigger and more complex issue than just thinking, well, is a catchment comprised of 300,000 people or 400 or 500,000 people? How does that align to a large metro public health service? And, and, and what other alignments are there across primary health, um, police districts, local government areas, for instance? Um, so so it, is, it is a complex issue, which I'm sure anyone in the, in, in the health system has grappled with over the last 10 or 15 years because it has come up repeatedly. But there are no easy solutions to this, in my mind, except to introduce um, choice and allow people to migrate freely and access the services where they would, where they would like to receive them. Thank you. Uh, at the risk of sounding like an auctioneer, anyone else? Thank you, uh, everyone. Uh, uh, Chair, if I can now allow the commissioners to take properly the stage. Thank you very much, Mr. O'Meara. Thank you all panel members for your contributions. Um, there are many, many questions I'm sure we could all ask, but in the interest of time, I'll just start with two issues I want to address and then I'll hand over to my fellow commissioners. Um, the first issue um, goes to the concerns about the current quality of inpatient care. and. Dr Grigg, in your statement, you make the point that the combined impacts of very short lengths of stay, heterogeneity of patients' needs, high levels of interpersonal violence and funding constraints have undermined the therapeutic nature of acute inpatient care. And I must say the commissioners have been deeply disturbed by some of the material before us about the lack of safety in inpatient units and the 
non-therapeutic nature of some of the care that is provided. Can you comment on whether it is in the interests of safety for all that we should consider streaming consumers to selected facilities, not by diagnosis, as Julie has warned us about, but by behaviours? So can I ask the, um, any of the panel members to comment on that? I'm, I'm happy to comment first, um, uh, Penny. I think uh, two areas of streaming I am very enthusiastic about. The first is the, the streaming by gender and providing more choices to women. And the second area of streaming, I would be, uh, I think it's very important um, sitting around some of those behaviours of concern, understanding though when you cluster those behaviours together, you have to really think very carefully about your model of care, your elements of security and safety and how you go about managing it. But, um, but I, I, I would share some of the horrors and anxieties that the Commission have around the mixing um, and the experience of some people on the community patient units. Dr. Kelly, did you want to add something on that? Look, they're, they're, very, they're very difficult and challenging environments. I can give you an example that about uh, three or four years ago, we did a, a study at Sunshine uh, Acute Unit where we saliva drug tested every consumer admitted to the intensive care area part of the ward over a three month period and 80% of those tested positive for amphetamines. So mixing uh, people with an amphetamine psychosis, mostly males, I've got to say, mm -hmm. aggressive driven, behaviorally disturbed males that were floridly psychotic with depressed vulnerable female consumers in the same space is completely unhelpful. So if you were designing a service from the ground up, you wouldn't design it the way that Sunshine Acute Unit is designed. It's a 30 year old model, frankly, with a 20 bed low dependency unit and a nine bed intensive care area. And uh, Margaret's comments are right on the money, mixing some of these very diverse groups with different levels of aggression or predatory behaviours at times, amongst other people with different levels of vulnerability is completely unhelpful. And this is the, this is the challenge. So as I said at the start, uh, we're trying to find beds for 31 consumers today in an already pressured environment where the average length of stay is nine days, not 28 days, nine days. In relation to that, it may well be that there's more limited consumer choice when it comes to some of those alternatives that might make sure we have better control over safety for all, both consumers and, and staff and those who are also involved in those facilities. Um, I'm glad, I'm, sorry, Commissioner, I'm glad you mentioned it. Uh, safety is, is critical for consumers around sexual safety, and this is what I was alluding to in my opening comment before, but also in terms of occupational violence for clinical staff. It, it is at horrendous levels, I've got to tell you. Thank you. Um, can I then go to my next issue, which um, we've talked about the importance of self-management and both Ms Anderson and you, Dr Grigg, in your statement talk about this. And I was very interested in the model that you talked about, Dr Grigg, in your statement in terms of the recovery college at Mind, where you talked about the fact that this is a model that works well and extensively in the UK, focused on using education principles to assess people to develop the self-management skills required to manage their own mental illness, peer developed and co-designed and peer educated. Can both you and Ms Anderson make comment on the relevance of that sort of model in our future service system? Um, I'll go first and then hear um, Julie. I would love I would love to see a model such as the Recovery College in a future design. Um, it was, uh, when I first visited a Recovery College in the UK, it was one of those aha moments for me, but also the experience of establishing it in mind. Um, what I learnt about in the context of what really mattered to people, and to give a, a little bit of an example we were wanting to um, uh, run a unit uh, in uh, medication management. And look, it wasn't the usual psychoeducation stuff. When we came back and asked people about what was important, um, 
You know, they talked about having the skills to talk with their doctor about how they might reduce or change their medication. They talked about having the skills to research the medication for themselves. On the, they were much less interested in the technical details than what that medication meant to them in their lives. Pretty similarly, I did one of uh, the courses which was on the development of advanced statements. But that was run by a woman who was two weeks out of an acute inpatient unit, talking in very practical ways of how important an advanced statement was to her and the way in which it had changed her experience of an involuntary admission in an inpatient unit. So I have to say as a model of care, I, um, uh, it, it was somewhat inspirational to me in thinking about how we could do things differently. Thank you. Mr Anderson, do you want to add some comment? I'm uh, really um, impressed with recovery colleges and how the model's set up in the UK. I think um, on, on various levels that people can come together and connect around common issues and learn some psychoeducation, being, to be given the tools they need in terms of their own recovery journey and to experience that with other peers, I think is quite powerful. We might well follow that up further in terms of an idea. So can I hand over now to Dr. Cochrane and then I'll go to Professor McSherry and Professor Fells. So Thank Dr. You. Cochrane. Um, my question um, initially is to uh, Mr. Kelly. I wanted to come back to the topic around private beds. And if I put to you the hope, um, I'm sure that many Victorians have, that in a reconfigured system, um, the length of stay in the inpatient units can go back to a more adequate level, that the gap between inpatient care community and the parks um, repositions those other aspects to be able to deliver the kind of care people would hope, and an inpatient setting becomes, um, again, able to provide both streaming and multidisciplinary care, again, in the way that many have asked for. In that context, where does the public in private model sit? And will it be able to provide a substituted model for uh, um, public mental health care or is it some alternative model that we should consider? No, I, I think it could. Uh, but I think we've got a, a wee way to go before we can close that gap between the level of acuity that's managed in the public system and the level of acuity, for lack of a better word, that can be managed in the private system. Um, so what would that model offer, do you think, the private model in that um, hopefully improved public system? Oh, well, ideally, you'd love to have a, a, a continuity of care for those folks that are being cared for in, in private psychiatry, that they can um, move pretty seamlessly between the public and private system, depending on their needs. At the moment, um, a person's level of unwellness or acuity has to meet a threshold where involuntary treatment is required before uh, that person would, would be required to be transferred to a public um, uh, mental health facility. So I think I think there could be much a much more uh, seamless and complementary arrangement between the public and private system, much like we've striven to do through the um, private consulting suites. In, in regard to community care, I think you could extend that to do it uh, quite cleverly with with uh, inpatient care as well. Um, just to continue that question to Dr. Grigg, do you think that, um, and in your experience in some of your past work, that the private system can offer um, different components of streaming around either particular cohorts or different diagnoses? Um, I certainly do, and it may turn out to be one of the most efficient ways. So the private, private hospitals offer a model of care that, for example, for older vulnerable consumers is often a really, really good model of care and often reflecting the need for slightly longer um, longer um, admissions into units. And I think that it's, um, I think that it's, uh, there is a design issue. I would encourage uh, inpatient care is just one of the offerings um, in the private sector. Also thinking about how we can grow and develop more stronger links with private psychiatrists and private psychology 
both of which I'm, I'm lucky I'm at an organisation for a range of reasons, we probably don't experience the workforce pressures around psychiatry and psychology that I'm where many mental health services do. Um, but I think that it's really important to think about the ways in which we can make sure that, um, that into a redesigned system, we are effectively using all of that assets that that system has. And there's a lot of asset in the private system that I don't think we've thought about how to use as effectively as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Professor McSherry. <laughs> Uh, yes, just a, a question for Ms Anderson. Uh, you've explained the difference between co-design and co-production um, very well in your, your statement. And uh, we've heard today about the importance of, of hope throughout the system and the importance of peer workers in general. I'm just wondering, do you have a view as to what would um, help the most to facilitate uh, co-design and co-production? Is it a matter of leadership or is it a matter of um, giving more power to various consumer organisations or a bit of both? I think um, if, we, if we look at the current setting uh, of inpatient units, I think the UK has a really good toolkit on experience-based design and I think that's a starting point. Um, in, in the design of services, I think we can build on that. And I don't think it's too complicated. A lot of co-design and co-production processes can get very complicated and they're not, be, they're not able to be replicated at different services. So I think that um, it's a very good example from the UK about experience-based design and how they've implemented that into the the um, everyday running of the service. Just to follow up in, in terms of co-production, um, is, is it better at this stage to you know, think about funding smaller um, projects and processes uh, with the hope of, of ramping them up or um, should it be like a, a top-down system so that um, you know, there's, there's some sort of mandatory role that you, that, that services must have co-production throughout. Do you have a view on that? I think it's yes. both. And, uh, I, I think it is a bit of top down and, and, and grassroots learning around that. I think if you start off um, in terms of smaller um, projects that that can um, support a set of champions that belong to services that can go out and, and talk to their service. But I also think it needs the management and the leadership to be on board around the process. It's not just some consumer idea that's coming <laughs> and we don't give it much credence. We'll just nod our head and tick the box. I think it needs management. So I think it needs that mandated process as well. Right, thank you. Yeah. Professor Fells. Um, I wonder if we could hear from one or two of the witnesses, maybe Miss Anderson to begin on the role of families and carers in all of this, uh, including in governance and in system design, but participation and so on. I think it's good to for families and carers. Um, well, families and carers have their own needs around mental health issues, and I think their needs are not are not being met at at the moment in the current system. Um, I think that the, the uh, I can't speak on behalf of families and carers, but I think in terms of a person having connectedness, meaning supporting their identity and being empowered that families need to be involved definitely if that's possible from a consumer perspective. I, I have not. I might yeah. Professor Fells, because I think that um, I've talked about recovery, you know, from personal recovery. I've talked a little bit about recovery and organisational and team recovery, but often particularly the families we work with also going through their own recovery journey. They're, 
the experience of families, not just of the illness itself and the, what that means in families, but often their, their experiences, very negative experiences of attempting to use the service system are often really, really difficult. And I think that, um, uh, you know, I try and use the word lived experience workforce to really talk about finding ways to appreciate various lived experience, both individual and from family and carers, and also recognising that we actually have a significant number of people who have lived experience of both, who have both lived experience of their own mental health issues, but actually also ended up in caring roles, and that it's quite a complex and fluid issue. And one, you know, I, I would certainly um, uh, say and acknowledge from this organisation's perspective that we have no, not done anywhere near enough work to really think about the ways in which the experience of family and carers are integrated and connected to think of into the way in which we design our service and go about doing our business. I think it's such an important topic. Thank you. Now, I had one other two-part question, or two questions, maybe for Peter Kelly. Um, the activity-based funding, um, as you know, when people first thought of that in the 1960s, I think the very first really serious bit of work on it mentioned mental health would be especially difficult. And I wondered if you had any, could say a touch more about the challenges and benefits of activity-based funding. And secondly, not totally unrelated, <coughs> and something you touched on in one of your answers, or well, more than that, uh, we have in, um, in Victoria, in Australia, in the world, massive geographic inequity right across the system. Have you any general thoughts on you know, what we do about it after all these years of not having been terribly successful? Well, two good questions. So I think firstly, the activity-based funding is a tremendous challenge for mental health services. I, my, my understanding is it's not been successfully implemented in activity-based funding uh, model uh, anywhere uh, successfully in the world for, for mental health services. Um, I think that was the whole point of shadowing the system for a year to see how the two systems run in parallel and whether there are perverse incentives or disincentives built into the system that were unintended um, artifacts, if you like, of, of, of the model. Um, but I think the, the group that's been pulled together to work on this, I think, have pretty high levels of confidence that the model could, could succeed and could deliver uh, what it's intending to in terms of um, sort of mandating or specifying the types of interventions that have to be provided for, for, each, um, for each consumer when they enter a service. And, you know, just in our own service, for instance, we mandate six interventions. So psychological interventions, family and carer work, health and well-being, vocation, lived experience, and overcoming hurdles as six sort of modalities that every consumer should receive when they enter the service. An activity-based funding model is a way to ensure that those things are delivered and delivered to a satisfactory standard. Um, it's it's an interesting space to be involved in because these are these are uh, some some people that have been involved in the system for 30 35 years and grappled with this issue a number of times over that over that time period but i think the time is right inequity well again again a big challenge the the inequities exist in metropolitan melbourne as you've as you've pointed out but in rural and remote australia and um, um, uh, it is it is it is a fact of life, and it's something that needs to be addressed via a reorganisation of catchments or a reorganisation of funding. Um, but it seems to me that it's a combination of population-based planning, along with a closer and clearer look at the demography in a particular area. And I, I often use the the, the you know the the uh, discrepancy between St Albans and Toorak, for instance. They are they are poles apart for a whole heap of reasons. Um, not the least of which is income and level of private insurance coverage for, for as, as two examples, but access to good education, housing, um, unemployment rates, 
Um, and it's, it's, it's sort of a bit of a fact, isn't it? As housing becomes tighter, people on the margins get pushed further and further out of metropolitan Melbourne. Uh, it wasn't that long ago that Melton was seen as the sort of uh, the fringe where people went when they couldn't get uh, you know, access to good rental housing in, in St Albans or Sunshine. But it's further afield now as the market tightens up. I, I don't have the solutions. I'm, I'm just acutely aware of the problem because I experience it every day, as I'm sure uh, consumers do as well. Thank you. Um, so thank you all panel members for your very considered input. I mean, as I think uh, um, my introductory comments and that of uh, Stephen and Mira highlighted, this is a really foundational piece for the design of our future mental health system here in Victoria. None of the ample answers are straightforward and we as commissioners are grappling with the very hard decisions we might need to make in terms of how do we overcome some of the current deficits in the system and today's discussion has been very helpful to us, as has our consideration of your individual witness statements. Um, we will also potentially take up some of the suggestions that you've made and follow through on some of the ideas that you've highlighted today in our discussion. Um, and we thank you very much for the contribution that you've made to our deliberations. So thank you very much.